Let's be loud and awake and drunk with tired. Welcome to the stage, Melissa Joan Hart and Cal Mitchell. Hey! Oh, I like, oh, okay. 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 <laughs> How has your awesome con been? I've been having a good time. I love it. You guys having a good time? Woo! Anyone here yesterday? <laughs> two day passes. All right, I got you. you. And there were people here Friday as well. I mean, it was That's right. It was so fun to see the guest interaction, right? The people who purchase the tickets who come here and have a chance to talk to you down at your booth. I imagine for both of you, do you have when people come up to get you know an autograph or a photo with you, which they're they're doing that again today as well. They must tell you like this something you did when you were working on the show changed their life. Do you hear that a lot? Like, I mean, we heard it yesterday when you and I talked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get, um, my favorite thing that people say is I grew up with you. And recently, I've been hearing a lot, I said this yesterday in the panel, but I've been hearing a lot recently, like, I go to bed with you. Um, <laughs> Hello. Or I go to sleep with Here you. Here we go. I guess I should oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. So like, I guess, you know, everybody likes that comfort TV. I get yeah. it, because I do it yes. with, like, friends, or How I Met Your Mother, or, so... You know, there's those shows that you like watch before you go to bed, and that's been a big compliment to hear. Yeah. So, and, and and I'm coming to you with that question next, okay. but this reminds me. And do come up to the microphone to get your questions asked. Um, when you say comfort television, what I love about that is oftentimes, even you know, the darker version of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and you know, shows like Black Mirror. I can't watch those. I can't. When you say like go to bed with you, right? It's like right. stressful. Yeah, I don't my want stressful. And I just started streaming or. Uh, uh, binging, I guess, Lost. We'd never seen it before. Oh, it's so good. So it'll start, keep you up. But it so freaks good. me out. It I don't does. know why. I watch freakier things than that, like Handmaid's Tale or Game of Thrones. But like, Lost is really freaking me. I don't know if it's the music, but it freaks it's me so out. Good. I'm like, I gotta watch something else. Like, my husband's like snoring, and I'm like, nope, I gotta get to, I gotta get to a How I Met Your Mother. Like, I, I can't go to bed on this. <laughs> right, exactly. What's that like for you when people come down and say, hey man, you, you're you really like brought us so much joy. Yeah, know? it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. I love that people uh, still enjoy it. I love the stories that they tell me, like they were going through a bad day and then they watched Keenan and Kel or all that and they put a big smile on their face. And uh, that's why I like doing the cons because I get to hear like the the cool stories of you know how I made them feel. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. I'm gonna try to scoot my chair back because it occurs to me that I'm a little far forward. I'm probably you guys are stuck looking at the knots in the back of my hair because it was a disaster getting ready this morning. Let's go for a question over here. What's your name? Where are you from? Hi, uh, I'm Heather Marie. I live in Washington, D.C. Hey. Um, hi, Heather Hello. Marie. Uh, Melissa, this is a question for you. Um, first of all, Clarissa was my style icon in the 90s. Uh, <laughs> that is, actually, that is something I do hear a lot is that like people got into fashion because of Clarissa, or I heard someone say to Beth Broderick yesterday, who played Aunt Zelda on Sabrina, that they got into science because of her. That's they became cool. a scientist. So that's always awesome. Will Wheaton was talking about that as well, which you, I have to love that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Um, I'm curious if you think that Clarissa and Sam ever end up together. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I think so. When they get older and they realize... There is a book, actually, that the writer, Mitchell Kriegman, wrote called um, Things I Can't Explain, and it was uh, like a later version of Clarissa, and we were working on a reboot for Nickelodeon for a minute there, but the heads all changed, and, um, and it, it just got, I guess, just disappeared, but um, his version, Mitchell, the, the showrunner, the creator, he's been living with this version of Clarissa, which I think is like, he was thinking about how she grows up. I've been thinking about her in the past. Whenever I talk to you guys, I talk about who she was and what she did and how she, you know, what she wore and how she behaved and what she believed. And so I think I, I, I still hold on to her as she was. And I feel like the fans kind of do too. But this things I can't explain, you guys should check it out because um, I wonder if you would agree with it. Um, uh, in that book, apparently, mom and I actually stopped reading it because I got kind of disturbed. But um, <laughs> mom and dad are divorced, and uh, Clarissa lives in the city, but she doesn't like the city. And I, it was, it was weird. It was like we had done a CBS pilot. We were going to bring it to CBS, and she was going to New York City. And she was going to be a journalist, and we did this great pilot, and um, and it was all about her becoming a journalist in New York City and being adventurous and loving the the pulse of the city. And then the book, a few years later, 20 years later, is like the opposite. She's terrified of the city and she's scared of everything. And I was like, I think that the writer kind of took it 
like made it a middle-aged man going through a midlife crisis <laughs> instead of like who Clarissa was. So I don't know. I'd be I'd be curious if you guys uh, next con you guys come out and tell me what you think of the book. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, question over I here. I, wait, I didn't really answer. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> wait, you're like wait. Let me go back to that. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think uh, I think it's too much of a special relationship. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm Danielle from Salem, Mass. Hello. Hi, Danielle. Hey. Very nice. Um, so I was wondering, as actors on shows geared towards children your own age, did you guys get to have any input on the content in the, tel in the shows? I like that question. That's a really good one. Yeah, we totally did uh, on all that. Uh, a lot of my characters that I did in the um, audition room, um, I was able to put into the show. Uh, the writers did a lot of that. I had a coach that was like really, really mean to us <laughs> in Chicago, and he was like, nobody cares about Valentine's? And it was literally like that. And uh, they took that and made that Coach Creighton, you know, with him screaming all the time. Uh, and then I did Ed in the room as well, uh, because I love Bill and Ted, Excellent Adventure, Saved by the Bell. So I was like, well, dude, yeah. Oh, cool, dude, yeah. So I did those voices in there, uh, and the writers would bring us in a room, play with us, you know, as far as like, uh, what type of characters do you want to do? And we would create together, which was cool that they let kids do that at the same time. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, the only example I can really think of is that on the Clarissa audition, the, the producer asked me, it was my, my third audition, which was just to sit down with the producer, and he was, he's a tough cookie, and he was like, do you like New Kids on the Block? And I went, I hate them. <laughs> and then I went, oh gosh, he's in the industry, he probably knows them, it's probably his nephew. I just blew this, like I just totally blew this. And I'm sitting there in my head just going, what an idiot I am, what an idiot, like I just blew this. And he was like, well, who do you like? And I was like, they might be giants. And next thing you know, they might be giants is on the wall of Clarissa's bedroom. And so um, I, in those ways, yeah, I mean, there are some things the producer put in there. She would never wear purple. Although if you come to my booth, there's a Clarissa photo and I'm in purple leggings. So that's weird. But I think it's the only time that purple ever shows up on the show. He refused. He made it. He put it in the Bible. Like every TV show has a Bible and it's like the rules of the show. And um there, there would never be purple displayed on Clarissa or in her room or something like that. So, and I've always asked him what that was about. And he was like, I just wanted to see if people would follow the rule. So, um, yeah, at first he wouldn't tell us. And it's only recently that he's like, yeah, I just wanted to see if people would do that. If I could like have that power. That's crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, I guess in ways like I actually created an episode. I wanted my little sister on my show on Clarissa, and I, I wanted to do an episode where Clarissa babysits like a total bad seed, and I wanted to be played by my little sister who's 10 years younger than me, Emily, who played Amanda in Sabrina years later. Um, and funny enough, voices Clarissa in that book, Things You Can't Explain, She's, she does the audiobook. But um, I wanted my sister Emily on it, and then the writers wrote the episode, and then they cast um, Michelle uh, Trachtenberg, Trachtenberg instead of my sister. I was like, well, I love Michelle, but I wanted my sister in the show. <laughs> But yeah, so in some ways they took what I said, but I'm also not one of the actors that likes to change things in a script. I like to try to make it work the way they saw it. So I, um, I, I don't often make a lot of script changes or anything so like that, never, but I try to influence. So they never came to you and said, hey, what do you think that people your age would want to see? No, not really, but they do, I feel like every TV show, they make you fill out some kind of form, and they're like, what can you do? I was like, I can play the flute, so if you watch Clarissa, I play the flute, and I can do ballet. Okay, let's put you in some ballet slippers for an episode, or, you know, so you find out what people's talents are, like, um, on Sabrina, Harvey, Nate, Richard, um, was a great dancer, so they did a scene where, like, he got a magical spell put on him, and he does this whole routine, because he could actually pull that off, you know, so finding out people's talents, they usually infuse the show with those sorts of things. But um, I can't say other than that they might be giants that I really had a lot of influence. <laughs> I would say things I didn't want to do. I'm like, I don't want to wear that. I don't want to say that. That's uncomfortable. That makes me awkward, like feel awkward, so. Thank you. That is a great question. I think, so purple's like the green M&M &M that you hear, that the musicians put in their writers, right? No green m and just to see if you actually read the just document. I have never, in all of the, the Comic-Cons that I've done, have ever heard about the show Bible until today. So I will come to you, but I've got to get this question. Yeah. Tell me more, so you say every show has, and is that like a, a known phrase? If I went up to someone else on episodic TV and was like, hey, tell me about your show Bible, they would know? Like, is that, so and what, 
what is in the book? Like when you say show. I've actually things. never seen a Bible, but everybody has to. I just recently went back to college in the fall and took a course on screenwriting. And you could either, in the class, you could either be writing a TV show or you could write uh, a movie script. And if you're writing a TV show, you had to create a Bible. Um, but I wasn't part of the TV show writing, so um, I I should know it. Do you know? Have you seen a Bible? <laughs> yeah, it's really just all like the the rules that are in there as far as like this is how the show goes, it's the outlines, it's the breakdowns, it's what actually happens with the show. And like, so that way, like, the, I would imagine yeah. Young Sheldon. Like I work on Young Sheldon, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine the Bible on that thing because the the prophecy from Big Bang Theory mm -hmm. is so severe. Dad has to have a heart attack. Dad has to cheat on mom. Like the things that have to happen because of what they've already put in the show before. So the timeline of things, like by the time Sheldon is this age, something has to happen and he has to go to college at this age because they said it in the show before. So they have to follow the rules, right? Sort of. Yeah, and they, they mix up the writer sometimes and so it's so that they can stay with the story. Because yep. if they don't stay with the story, then it's like, what show am I watching now? <laughs> you know, so then you just, oh, go to the show Bible, refer back to it, you know what I mean? Okay, yeah. that, makes, that makes a lot of sense, especially <laughs> when you have a whole team of writers and people do move on and off shows. When they do, that's like Sabrina, we had one, like one person wrote the pilot, but then we had a showrunner for the first season, but then we had a different showrunner for season two and three, and then different one for four and five, and you know, you're constantly switching people out. And each showrunner wants to create different characters. People always ask me why certain people didn't stay on Sabrina and whatnot. It's because each showrunner, I think, gets paid on the characters they develop. So if they bring in a new character, then they get paid on that character. So it's, it kind of, you know, is beneficial to them to kick people out uh, is and bring why in fresh blood. My favorite blood. characters die because someone want, got a good idea and wants to bring in someone new to get paid. I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> Game of Thrones. They must have gotten paid a lot. No, seriously. Oh, <laughs> right? do not. They're killing everybody. Else. First, you... <laughs> one minute you think it's this guy's show, next minute it's that guy. I'm like, what's going on? Whose show is this? And it just gets more. And I read the books and I knew it was coming, and it was still so brutal. Let's get to <laughs> right. Let's get to a question over here. Hi, how are you? Hi, hey. I'm Margarita from Alexandria. Hello, Margarita. Rita. And my question is, if you could go back, what, were, what piece of advice would you give your Nickelodeon era self? And part two, what advice would you give to the current generation of the Nick Disney stars out there? Go, you, go. <laughs> okay. you have good perspective Okay, on so uh, as far as like the new generation of kids, I was able to actually do that, which was, was fun. Uh, when we brought uh, all that back uh, in 2019, me and Keenan, uh, I was able to tell the kids something that I wish was told to me. And so I told them that this is not the thing that makes you special. All right, you were made special when you were born in the womb, when you were born. And so this is a job, and this is just a journey that you're gonna be on for a, a long time. You know what I mean? Whether you decide to keep acting or not, uh, this is just a stepping stone. And I wanted them to understand that so that they can have a good sense of self um, and know who they are and know their worth. And then that way they enjoy the experience. So it's not a lot of like competition or getting caught up in the character of who you're playing, you know? Um, so that was one thing that I told the, the new generation. And then as far as myself, uh, I would say enjoy the moment. Enjoy every uh, moment from it all, because I think I was just so like, I mean, it helped to an extent, but at the same time, I was just really like, I just got to be the funniest thing ever. And you know what I mean? And I've got all these characters, and I was like, I mean, it was good because I was competing with myself every day with the characters, but at the same time, I was not really enjoying it to the point of enjoy every moment. I was really just kind of going uh, focused, <laughs> you know what I mean, on making it really crazy. But then at the same time, uh, still saying, hey, I was a teen at the same time, too. It was a lot that uh, I took in as far as like uh, an adult role. Uh, with growing up in adulting in front of the public eye, you know what I mean? So I would just tell myself, hey, it's gonna be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, I, you know, I just got to direct the cast of iCarly. They're not young, they're younger than me, but they're, you know, they're obviously grown-ups now, but, um, but I feel like, I don't know, when I work with younger kids and whatnot, I mean, a big thing for me in the industry is making sure that just because you are the star of a show, you don't act like the boss. Um, you're still part of a bigger crew of people that work together to make the show come alive, and with any one person, you can't do it. So um, trying to make sure that 
like the younger generation doesn't let this go to their heads. I mean, there's all these YouTube stars and all these, you know, people coming up and they think, my kids think that, you know, YouTube stars are just the most brilliant, amazing, you know, and, and you know, and kids on Nickelodeon and, you know, it looks like they, they've got it all going on, but they're still kids and I think they still need to act like kids, but they need to respect adults and they need to, you know, be professional if you're going to be on set. Um, but I think that probably the, like, the advice I wish I was given... I wish I had stayed in school. <laughs> I wish I hadn't um, kind of been forced to do like a homeschool situation, like a, it was tutoring. And nowadays you would call it virtual <laughs> or whatever, but like, or, or like homeschooling. But um, I wish I had stayed in a school setting in a social atmosphere because I was pulled out of it to do the show and thrown into sort of a, a big job, a big career with a lot of pressure. Um, by the time I was, I was, I was acting since I was four, but by the time I was 14, I was doing Clarissa, like, yeah, like 13, 14. And it was like right around the time when I was going to high school and I no longer had friends. I had the two boys on the show and I had whoever rolled into the stage next door to me. Um, but not like everybody was kind of in and out of my life. And I learned really quickly to say goodbye to people that meant a lot to me in a short amount of time. Um, so it was hard. It didn't really nurture a lot of friendships. I do, I'm still very, very close with the people who worked on Clarissa. There's uh, the producer's assistant and uh, my wardrobe um, girl, uh, Michelle and David. They are my kids' godparents. I just saw them last week in Connecticut mm -hmm. and um, I'm really close with them. You probably even know, you probably yeah, know, know Michelle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so I stayed close with some of, some of the people, but they were a lot older than me and I, so I had to kind of grow up quick. So I would probably say to like the next generation, like, you know, hold hold tight to friendships. Do good in school. Keep, you know, keep looking forward. Like this, this is a job, and you need to save your money, and then you can, you know. But don't like, don't put all your eggs in this basket. Like, keep moving forward. Yeah. That's a great question, Margarita. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you 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 get pulled out of school. You're doing the tutoring, um, and now you just mentioned you've gone back to college. So what is that? Because you, <laughs> tell me about that. Then that's a auditing. perfect segue, right? I'm um, curious about this screenwriting. Yeah, no, you know what, I realized I, like, I fought so hard not to learn the industry because I felt like I was in the industry, I wanted to learn other things, so I did go to NYU off and on for seven years, never graduated, um, but I, like, what I, I studied everything except our industry. I studied sociology and child psychology, and, like, I, I dabbled in everything to try to find something, uh, Italian Renaissance, and... I was like, I gotta find something for when this acting thing fails, what am I gonna do? But I should have been probably just honing in on a craft, like directing and writing. So now I'm working more on that. I've been directing for 20 years, but you know, I'm now I'm really like focused on directing. And now I wanna write, because I realize as a non-writing producer, it's not as easy as being a writing producer to get the things made that you wanna get made. So I, like, I, called Bill Murray and said, I want to direct this movie, will you be in? He's like, did you write it? And I was like, no. He's like, oh, okay, send it to me. But had I written it, he'd probably be like, let's do it. You know, like, that's cool. Like, you wrote it and you're directing it, let's do it. But, um, so I was like, I really need to get this writing thing. Like, I need to figure out, I didn't think I could write. I thought I was a bad, I'm like, I'm a bad writer. And then I was like, well, no, I've never tried. <laughs> Maybe I should take some classes and try. So I read some books. I talked to some people I know in the industry that, Right, like Nick Bakai, who played the cat on Sabrina, he's the showrunner of Mom, and he was the showrunner of like King of Queens, and did some big shows. So I was like, "Hey, you're gonna mentor me." Actually, I owe him a script. It was due on Friday. <laughs> Classic college like, experience. Might be a few more weeks till he gets that one. Been a little busy, but um, yeah. So you know, so it's I'm I'm just and I'm also like a lifelong learner. I just love learning, and I was a good student, and I hate that I was like pulled out of school because I was such a good student, and the kind of environment we grew up in didn't really lend itself to getting an education. It was all about do the minimum so that you can be on set the, for maximum. Okay, thank you, thank you. Question over here, hi. Hi, JC from uh, Frederick, Maryland. Hi, JC. Uh, this question's for Kel. Hey. Um, given how serious Coolio took himself back in the 90s, <laughs> how he didn't want Weird Al doing that parody, how did you guys get him to do the theme song for Keenan and Kel? <laughs> what was cool about uh, all that uh, in Keenan and Kel, uh, it was Nickelodeon's, like, they wanted to get more uh, diversity, you know what I mean, which was cool, and so it was like their first time trying this, and all that was actually uh, a special. 
because Nickelodeon had never did anything like this, you know, with a whole bunch of hip hop and all that stuff like that. Uh, so with the success of all that and them seeing Keenan and I uh, behind the scenes, uh, they wanted to spin off and do the Keenan and Kel show. And Brian Robbins uh, was very good friends with Russell Simmons uh, and with Universal Interscope Records. Uh, and so we had Coolio come on and do the show and, and it helped because on all that, we had every musical guest. I mean, we had Usher, we had TLC, uh, everybody. So uh, Coolio was excited to do it. And he loved Good Burger. He was already in some Good Burger sketches. Uh, and I remember when we did it, uh, we shot it at Universal City Walk. Uh, and when we did that, Coolio got on the radio station uh, and he told everybody, hey, I'm doing a theme song to Keenan and Kel. Come down. And every kid from Los Angeles was there. <laughs> and it was like this big crowd, but uh, Keenan and I loved it. It was like we were like performing with Coolio, so it was pretty cool. Yeah. He, was, he actually did a spot on Sabrina, too. And, yeah. I, and I actually did some race car driving with him. He's yeah, here he's in D.C., actually. <laughs> and he's like a really cool, laid-back kind of guy. Yep. So, yeah, he's, he's a really fun guy. Yeah, we're still friends now. Yeah, he just has the two pieces of hair now. <laughs> 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 For real, he does that. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is bald. It's good. <laughs> That's the homie. Shout out to Coolio. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question. Hi, question over here. Hi, I'm Stephanie Evans from Germantown, Maryland. Hello. I have actually okay. a question for both of you guys as children actors. I'm a giant Star Wars fan. Kenobi series just dropped, obviously. Children actors are clearly in there. And my first thought was, oh my God, if this bombs, those kids are going to get destroyed. As children actors, how should fans support you guys through the children, through negative crit uh, criticism? Because Star Wars fans, I hate to say it, can be brutal. And I just wanted to know, as a fan, how can I support these children that are taking in probably some of the biggest roles of replacing Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill? Well, and, and Stephanie, to your point, social media factors into this now yeah. in a way yeah. you didn't See, have to deal with. And my That's first thought, honestly, was Phantom Menace and what we did to Jake. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, that was my first thought. So I just you know, wanted to know what your thoughts were on it. I, I have to say, you don't, hopefully those kids, and I don't know who they are, but hopefully they've gone through a lot of audition process because there's a lot of rejection in this business and you don't make it through unless you can handle rejection. Yeah. So there is that aspect. Like, if you've been through the audition process, you've, like I was in the movie Crocodile Dundee, but I was cut out. I was told while I was on a set in Vancouver shooting a movie called Christmas Snow that I was cut out of Crocodile Dundee. And it was a huge heartbreak, but I was like, oh, all right, do you have any salt and vinegar potato chips? You know, so I think I was used to rejection, but I didn't take it as, I didn't take it as rejection. It was just another thing that happened in the industry. But we didn't grow up with social media, so I don't know how much they'll see. Hopefully, they're just super excited to be a part of the franchise. Hopefully, they made best friends with John Favreau, or they're like, you know, they, they get free passes to Disney. So I think they'll be okay, like in the sense that they're in this world. And I think also because the Star Wars world is so vast and huge, that there's there's the the they will hopefully the good will drown out the bad. So if you guys feed them with a lot of like, you know what, what a great franchise, oh my God, it's so amazing. Like if you see them at a con, you know, it's so amazing that you're a part of that family. Like you get to hang out with this one and that one and be on set with this person and do that and wear that costume and get shot by a laser or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I think that all that cool stuff will overpower the fact that a few people might be like, that kid sucks, Is you know, I can't, he doesn't even look like him or whatever, you know. Yeah. Hopefully uh, you guys can drown it out with the good and that's what their parents will feed them. <laughs> yeah, that's why, uh, like what I was saying earlier, telling the kids to have a good sense of self and to know that this is a job of many and other things that you'll be doing in your life. Uh, this is not the whole thing. You know, it's important to say that. And then within comments, too, because we dealt with that. I was on a show uh, called Game Shakers uh, on Nickelodeon. And within that show, we have, you know, very young kids. And people even in that were, like, kind of mean in the comments. Why would she wear that shirt? What is she doing? You know, and the girls were like, oh, no. And I was just like, you know what? We need to start looking at the positive comments and just focus on that as far in social media. And I know that can be hard because I've done it too. You'll see all of these, like you'll have a hundred 
positive things and one person to say one comment that's just horrible and you're like, you know what I mean? It kind of sticks with you. And the thing about it is, is that I was just letting them know, like, you know, focus on the positive. Like, really try to focus on that. Don't go towards and let it ruin your entire day. Get ready for your day, too, as well. Meaning that I'm going to respond to love. I'm going to respond to kindness. These people, this is a job. There's going to be other things that are going to be working for me in this. Um, That's very important. That's the other thing. Like, I mean, when you get a job like Star Wars as an actor, they're getting a ton of other calls before that movie's even finished. Mm -hmm. They're getting a ton of other calls from producers being like, hey, there's a Spielberg movie. You want to, or you should be, like, I worked with Nick Robinson on my show, No Good, uh, uh, what was it? Melissa and Joey, that show. So Nick Robinson did Jurassic World when he was mm-hmm. on our show. And then he went off to do Love, Simon. And then he did, you know, now he's in the show Made. And he was on the other, like, he's just got this massive career. And everybody's pulling at him. But before he even finishes one movie, you're on to the next movie. So if you're in that Star Wars world and you've been booked on it, your agents are making phone calls. He's in the next Star Wars. Do you want him to see him for this movie? You know, and he's probably got, they probably already lined up numerous jobs. So as far as their careers go, they're probably on an like an uptick for sure. So hopefully they're riding that wave without letting their heads get too big. And, um, and you know, but there will be, there. It, the, this business is a roller coaster. It's not the kind of business where you build up to like, you know, you get the promotion and you get the corner office and you get the big raise and you know, it's, it's not a building kind of job. It's very much a like peaks and valleys. So um, hopefully those kids can ride that out. Stephanie, I think I'll make it a point to ask Noah Schnapp from Stranger Things when he's here. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got 21 million TikTok followers, you know, millions on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'll make it a point to ask him, too, as someone who is 17 and living exactly what you're talking about. So we'll get his perspective on that as well. Thank you for the question. Hi, how are you? Hi, guys. Uh, Chris, I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Yo. This is a question for both uh, Keenan and Melissa. Um, you guys were both a big part of my childhood. I let Keenan know. <laughs> um, sorry, Let's Kel. Call him. No, it's okay. We both we both get that. We get that all the time. He just um, back and forth. We do it. Right. Yeah, it's funny. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so you guys were both a big part of my childhood. Um, as a child of both the '80s and the '90s, I some I find myself stuck in that decade sometimes. Whether it's like the musical choices that I still listen to even the clothes I still wear, even the, some of the words I still use. <laughs> and it's often much to the amusement of the younger people that work with me and work for me uh, at my job. Uh, a lot of jokes, old man jokes about it. Um, do you guys kind of find yourselves kind of stuck in the 80s and 90s as well uh, with that? And if so, like, do the people around you kind of like to maybe like poke fun in a good-natured way and whatnot? No, 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 I'll say this, uh, you know, and, and the thing about it is be yourself, bro. You yep. know what I mean? Enjoy being you. You know what I mean? I don't feel like it's a thing where you're stuck in the 90s or 80s. It's just a thing of like, look at it. Like, I'm in the fashion, you know, a lot of the 90s fashion is coming back, bro. So some of the stuff you got in your closet, bro, the teens are rocking <laughs> right now. You know what I mean? So don't even worry about that. Be yourself. Be excited about, you know, the things that you enjoy, uh, you know, and if people are saying, you know, negative things, hey, man. Man, just let that that bounce off. You know, you kind of let them know, like, hey, this is my style. This is who I am. You know what I mean? And I like the '90s. As far as like with me though, I'm a I'm a firm believer in like uh, reinventing yourself and, and doing. You know, like I love uh, the people love the '90s uh, and love the shows that we were on. Uh, but uh, I'm not like a walking TBT. You know what I mean? I always kind of right. tell people that, like, you know, it's the thing is, is that there's so much more uh, to come and there's different levels and different things that you do within your life, but you can enjoy every decade. You can enjoy what's coming up in the future. You can enjoy the present. So yeah, man, just enjoy life. I, I have three, well, you have four kids. I have four, I, yeah. I got th- three boys and yeah. two of them are teenagers. And they, they tease me all the time. But the thing is, like, I listen to lithium uh, XM radio, like 90s rock. Like, that's all I listen to. And if I'm listening to hip hop, it's like Tribe Called Quest. It's stuff from, like, back, you know, when I was listening. You know, I, I don't listen to new music. I'm starting to know it from, like, dancing at weddings or going to my kid's football game. And so, you know, I know a little, like, level up, you know, I, whatever stuff. But, like... <laughs> My kids think I'm totally uncool, but th- I think that's normal, right? They're supposed to, right? The younger generation is supposed to, but at the same time, they also like. We went to '90s Con yeah. a few months ago, it's not crazy. even like not that long ago, yeah. and it was. I mean, 
the fascination with the 90s is insane. So I feel like it's a, it's a good, it's probably like the way in the 90s I was obsessed with the 70s. I wanted my mom's bell bottoms and, you know, little tube tops and that kind of thing. So, I mean, on Clarissa, I wore a ton of like peace signs and onks and stuff. So I feel like, um, you know, we like, we always look at about 20 years previous as our style or our music uh, as being kind of vintage cool. And the 90s is now vintage cool. So I think it's something to celebrate, you know? And it's also like, the I keep saying this, but it's like the last age of innocence. It was like before 9-11 changed things and we have to take off our shoes at TSA. You know, it's before big drops and big serious, it seems like serious, I know there were always serious problems. If you listen to Billy Joel, we didn't start the fire, right? There's always been problems. <laughs> But, um, good song to listen to right now, by the way. We have to figure out how to update that. But, um, you know, <laughs> but then you, like, I feel like the 90s was still an innocence. And, um, and some of these kids will never get to really experience that sort of, you know, after the Cold War. I know growing up in New York, we were doing, like, air raid drills in case the Russians bombed us and stuff. You know, it was like, that stuff, that, all those fears kind of went away in the 90s. And I feel like there was this one decade where it was like, it felt good for a minute. And, you know, you got to know that people that were born after 2000 don't really have, 2001, really don't have that sort of sense. And um, so I like to celebrate it. <laughs> thank you both. And uh, thank you for making my childhood awesome. Oh, thank hey, you. Thank and you, you have found your people. I love it. Uh -huh. Hi, question over here. How are you? Good. Uh, Jeff from Ashburn, Virginia. Uh, my question is for both of you. And that is... When you are playing a character that you're uncomfortable with, how do you make it work? Oh, um, go for it. No, you got <laughs> you I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, playing a character that I'm uncomfortable with? Um, a lot of times what I would do is, because um, I'm also a writer as well, <laughs> but if you're on a show where you're not the writer and you have this character that you're playing, a lot of that starts with the audition process. It's like if, if you even want to play this character. Uh, but then if you're on set and they write something for your character that you didn't necessarily want, um, you can have that conversation with the producers, you know, uh, if they're lenient to hearing what you want to say. Sometimes it's kind of like, this is what I want and this is what it is. Uh, but I feel like in the, you have to look at it for me, a lot of the characters that I play, it's always like, what's the end result? You know, and for me, it's always, even within the story, it always has to be some type of message at the end. And I love playing characters like that. I love movies like that. So if there's some type of message in it, and if the character does something that's a little wonky that I might not want to play, but as long as it, the end message is something positive that I want uh, the audience to see or to hear, uh, then I'll go with it. You know, I'll go with it. But other than that, then I'm, I'll definitely talk to the producers about it. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree about the like audition thing. Like if you get a script, like I just got a script that I, they wanted me to direct and it was a really dark topic and I wasn't really in the headspace to do it. They wanted me to rush through it too. And I was like, I don't feel like this is a topic. It was about human trafficking. And I was like, I don't feel like I can rush through this right now. I don't want to rush it. I don't want to be in that headspace right now. I know it's an important story to tell, but it was not, it's not my time to tell that story right now. Um, so, you know, I turned it down. It was a hard decision to make. Um, but I turn it down. But as far as like acting goes, I mean, if you're auditioning and you don't like the way that character is, you don't like the, you know, what's coming, what's coming up for that character, you, you know, you can kind of steer away from it or just turn it down, which is hard to do, but important to do if you really have a strong feeling about something. But it's more difficult when you're like in a series and you're like playing that character in a season three and all of a sudden they, you know, want you to do something uncomfortable. I don't know, just even like any script I get, I'm like, okay, when's the kissing scene? You know, like, who do I have to kiss? How many times? Um, you know, what, what are we talking about? Is it like, you know, are we, is it just a kiss? Is it like a makeout session? Is it like in bed? Is it, you know, so those kinds of things, like, I'm always like, all right, let's, you know, there's always going to be uncomfortable moments in anything. Even if I have to cry, if there's a scene, if there's like, I have a movie coming out on Saturday, um, where uh, it's called Dirty Little Secret on Lifetime, by the way. Um, and uh, it's dark, like, and I had to, but it was probably the first time I didn't freak out about like big emotional scenes. Um, I felt pretty confident in the playing of this character and the development that I did leading into it that I could pull off some of these 
harder scenes. But usually if there's like a scene where I have to cry or something, I'm like, I'm stressing about it. I'm like, oh God, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm a really ugly crier. I turn red, I snot. Like I don't get like the Demi Moore tear roll down my cheek, right? I'm not like, I'm not Claire Danes. I can just turn it on and one little tear goes down. I'm like, <laughs> I can't do that. I look totally awful. It, it, you know, people are like, what the, what the hell's going on with you? <laughs> like, like, sorry. Um, so I get really uncomfortable doing those sorts of scenes. But, you know, if you want to play the character and you want to, you just try to dive in, you try to be prepared, you try to work with the director or other actors and, you know, and work through some of those uncomfortable moments. But there's always uncomfortable moments in every script. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi, question over here. Hi, Sam from Illinois. Hey. My question, um, obviously, being a celebrity, the effect you have on people, could you please share, uh, an, like, a, I hate to say emotional, but one of your favorite moments you've had with a fan? My, it's hilarious, like, you guys might get mad about this, but um, when, I love when people come up to me, when they're Clarissa fans, Clarissa fans are the cutest because they come up and they always go like they'll be like oh my daughter wanted your autograph because they like Sabrina or this one and then they always, Clarissa fans always do the exact same thing they go but I remember you from Clarissa like <laughs> like I'm the only one and it's so funny because I hear it all the time and so if people are like can you guess what I know you from? like a gentleman yesterday I do you, can you guess what I know you from and I'm like oh it's gonna be Clarissa because you did the little eye side like yeah <laughs> It's gonna be Clarissa. And he was like, yeah, how'd you know? I was like, yeah, I get, I, like, it's so funny because Clarissa fans think they're the only ones that remember that show, which is, I, I just love it. I love it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same within that, because, you know, I have the Clifford the Big Red Dog fans that are, like, you know, super, super young. And then I'll have, uh, when I got started the new shows on uh, Nickelodeon, uh, I would have the young kids come up that never even watched Good Burger, and then I have the mom watching, and so the mom and the daughter are coming up for, for different reasons. Uh, but in, like, an emotional way, uh, I really like those, like, really serious like stories from fans. Uh, I had one um, person to come up uh, and her friend was dealing uh, with suicidal thoughts, not to get really deep on you, but it was just like they were coming up and it was really deep. And I always feel like um, when you, you need to really be yourself, social media has created that for us because I remember back in the day, people only knew us for our character. And what I use social media as is to show like who and who I really am, you know? And if you're coming to see, oh, I love Good Burger and I love all these shows and I love the movies that you do, but then I didn't know that you, you know, you love God, you deal with, uh, you know, motivating and all these different things. Uh, and I love that. And so a fan came up to me and said, man, I, I saw something that, about your life and about your story that you said online. Uh, and it really changed my friend's life. They, they, they were really about to take themselves out of here and they heard how you dealt with it and how you didn't do that. And so I just want to thank you in that moment. And we both had a big hug at that moment and I told them to continue to live. But I feel like that's what's so important to know that we are all family and nobody's bigger than anybody else and that we all are here for a purpose. So thank yeah. you. Very nice. We had a, a a guy who was in your panel uh, on Friday, his name was Marshall, and he had this great, like, voice, like, he could be a voice actor, and he was like, I love that you're a Jesus freak like me, and it was, like, <laughs> just such a great moment, yeah. so when you talk about showing who you are on social media, that resonates with me. Yeah. Question over here, and we are running out of time, but I think we might, if we go quickly, maybe uh, we can get to all of them. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, this is Joseph from Arlington, and I, and I remember that the shows, like, Keenan and Kel and Clarissa were filmed at Nickelodeon Studios, yes. at Universal Studios, Lord. <laughs> And uh, I want to ask, uh, what was your favorite memory or moment while filming at Nickelodeon Studios? <laughs> we were talking about this backstage. Don't tell like, him, uh, you don't tell me what you told me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know what? I, the, I know, we were like, do you remember much about Nickelodeon? Because how are we going to talk about this? Um, <laughs> Guys, that was a long time ago, okay? I've had like a few kids and a few experiences and, you know, lived in a few different cities. Um, but yeah, Orlando was interesting. I was living in New York and going down there, but it was a brand new, what I remember is it was a brand new facility, beautiful sound stages, mm -hmm. unlike the ones in New York and LA, which were like full of asbestos. So it was nice to have a nice, clean, big, state-of-the-art studio. Yeah. Um, 
one of the funny things is, did anyone here ever go on the tour of Nickelodeon back when it was, yeah? So do you remember the gack, the like slime kitchen? Yeah, it was like, like oh, slime yeah. time was a whole thing. Yes. So we had to go, so when you came through the tour, you could like go up above the, um, the sound stages, so you, like the tour would come through, and sometimes they, I guess they'd be like, let's see what's going on down on the Clarissa sound stage, and apparently I cursed a lot. <laughs> So oftentimes they'd be like, let's go see what's going on down in Clarissa. And they pipe in the sound and I'd be like, mother, you know, and like, like no, let's turn that off. Okay. Um, so they were like, you have to stop cursing so much. But the, but it was also awkward because like wardrobe, the people would walk through wardrobe. So we had to like get changed in there. And it's like, there's like a drape. And I'm like, there's people like, what's going on in here? And you're like, I'm getting naked. <laughs> um, and then you went through the slime and gack kitchen where you got to taste. So my favorite thing to do was like stop and like have like, can I have some pudding? Thank you. Do you have any applesauce? Okay, thanks. Like they had these giant vats of applesauce and slime that they colored for the slime and the gack. So that was, I was like, a little vanilla pudding, thank you. But then makeup and hair also was there. So you're like getting made up. Luckily, I was a young girl, not an old woman. And, um, <laughs> you know, but I would get my like hair highlighted and stuff. And like, I have foils in the hair. And there goes the 6 p.m. tour. And you're like, hi, everybody. <laughs> Just getting my hair done. Don't mind me. Um, so it was fun, but it was also yeah. like, you know, people would always on the street be like, oh, I saw you with the foil in your hair. And you're like, oh, great. Awesome. Great tour. <laughs> I remember uh, going to, because uh, you had Universe Studios right there, and so you had all the crazy rides. Uh, and so Keenan and I, uh, I remember we were dressed as Mavis and Clavis, the two old guys. <laughs> and so uh, we were like, let's just go on, you know, on to the park dressed as Mavis and Clavis. <laughs> and so we went on the park dressed as Mavis and Clavis, and we took the golf cart, you know, like the, the golf cart. So we just took a golf cart, so now we're zipping through the park. Uh, and we ended up like on the actual tour, and you know you're supposed to take a tram, but we were taking the car. <laughs> so now we're riding through it, and we're, oh look, there's the psycho house, and we're just riding on it. Now you're not supposed to do this, this is illegal, like what we're doing. And so we're all back there, right, and we're kids. And so now security comes, we have park security that's literally following us, and we're like, what are we gonna do? Like our parents are gonna kill us, you know, just the producers. And so the guys came up, and we're like, yo, just stay in character. Right? So, <laughs> and so this was improv skills on a hundred, right? Oh. So we're like, I'm, I'm just an old man. I don't know what's happening. I just, uh, I took a wrong turn over here. And they wrote us up actually as old men and we were good. And we, <laughs> we got off out of the whole thing. We just leave the park. Okay, I'll just go on now. I'll leave the park. <laughs> I'm going to leave the park. That was much more exciting. We used to just like be like, it's lunch break. Can we go on Back to the Future? <laughs> like, <did> that too. <laughs> Meanwhile, old lady now can't ride Back to the Future. <laughs> well, it's now Simpsons anyway. But right. You guys, and on that note, we will conclude this panel, but you can get your questions answered in person. They are signing today. Let's give it up. Loud and proud for Melissa, Thank Joan, you. Hart, and Cal Mitchell! Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.